name is Sarah Sabri. I am the Domestic Violence Resource Prosecutor, my official title at the Oregon Department of Justice within the Criminal Justice Division. What that means um, sounds, I'd say, probably a lot fancier than maybe what it really is. Um, I work within the Criminal Justice Division. Um, we have a number of attorneys and we do what, what's called DA assist, um, law enforcement and district attorney assist around the state. So we assist with cases, with legal information, um, with updating case law, uh, making sure that um, everyone around the state is trained and has the resources that law enforcement and prosecutors' offices need um, that sometimes they're not able to sort of devote the resources to internally, we're able to kind of do on a statewide level and push out to all of the um, attorneys around the state. We also have some um, criminal intelligence units within our um, program, but that's sort of, I'd say, kind of a separate part of that. Um, my history is that I am a, have been a domestic violence prosecutor for the last 13 years. I started my career um, as a prosecutor in uh, Lincoln County in Newport, um, and as a specific domestic violence prosecutor, I started on a grant-funded position, so I was doing only domestic violence work. Um, in retrospect, the fact that a brand new prosecutor was thrown straight into domestic violence work sort of makes my head spin a little bit, um, but it worked out for me. Um, I had some very great mentors there that allowed me to really delve very deep into this casework um, right from go. Um, after spending two years out in Newport, I moved to Lane County to Eugene, which is where I had gone to law school. and. Um, had some other sort of connections to go back to, um, and was there until just this last year in July. When I went to Lane County, I also did almost exclusively domestic violence prosecution. Um, in 2008, uh, was one of the two prosecutors that formed the domestic violence prosecution team, so that we had dedicated attorneys within the office um, that were specifically trained to handle these cases. We got all of the domestic violence cases, minus some of the homicides that came in, um, and really built that program up. And within the last the few years before I left, I was the team leader for that um, group. So we had dedicated advocates to domestic violence, um, a team of five prosecutors, a paralegal, a dedicated secretary, but which all helped very much in terms of understanding, making sure that all those bits and pieces um, that are sort of nuanced to this type of a caseload were really being handled very specifically. And then in July, I went to the Department of Justice, the Criminal Justice Division, um, to now be the statewide resource prosecutor. So what that mostly means for you is that I am a resource for all of you in here, specifically for the prosecutors and law enforcement. I'm someone that you can contact if you have questions. I can't, law enforcement and prosecutors I can specifically give legal advice to. Um, others I can't give legal advice in that sense, but I can definitely give um, recommendations for resource information, that type of thing. Um, so I was very honored when Leah contacted me and asked if I would come um, and speak down here. So I'm excited to kind of spread out a little bit around the uh, state and get to know folks that are doing this work. Um, I know it'll be on the um, sign-in sheet, but if I could just get kind of a quick show of hands in terms of who's in the room. Um, how many of you are law enforcement? And all patrol, or is there probation officers in the room? P &P I'm sorry? P and P, okay. What about um, advocates? Okay, a handful. Um, prosecutors? Okay. Um, <clears throat> other legal, community legal anything? Medical? Okay, so it looks like that's the bulk. What have I missed? Mental health. Yeah. Mental health, okay, and DAVAP? Okay, great. And anybody else I missed? Okay, so, and I certainly welcome questions and conversations throughout. Um, I, I find presentations are always a little more entertaining when I'm not the only one up here talking at you. So, um, my, this first slide here certainly says, you know, helpful tips for investigators and prosecutors. That's true, and all of this will, will go towards that, but I don't want any of you in here to think that the information doesn't also apply to the things that you're doing. I really tried to structure this presentation in a way in terms of the gathering of information that tends to then help investigations and prosecutions down the line. But this information and, and what it is that we're looking for and things that we should be um, considering along the way certainly are relevant to every, every person that is in this room. Um, on the front end, I'm a lawyer, so I have to give you the boring legalese. Uh, this just says, I stole some stuff from other presentations and from other sources, but I get to do that because I'm educating you. 
Um, and then also, just so that the disclaimer is there, this isn't a legal advice from the Attorney General or from the, from the Department of Justice. In fact, this isn't legal advice in that regard at all. Um, certainly every situation is fact dependent and I would encourage you, if you have specific questions, um, to the extent that I can answer those, I'm happy to, or um, to get in touch with, with your local um, agencies, either prosecutorial or civil legal authorities for those types of things. The other thing I'll say, um, and Mary mentioned it this morning too, just in terms of me using the, the pronoun female as the victim, I will do that. Um, and as the offender, I will use male. That's not because I believe that it can't be perpetrated in the reverse, or that there aren't same-sex relationships where it is um, both male, uh, female, and or, um, male um, offender and victim, or both uh, female offender and victim. But I will stand up here and make no sense if I say he, she, she, he, in an attempt to to keep that fair. So um, just. So that it said. So, why do we care? I mean, certainly we heard this morning about what the dangers are of, of strangulation and how critical that can be, and that the injuries that result from strangulation can lead to very quickly lead to death. But in terms of when we're looking at why do we need better investigations and better prosecutions, quite frankly, because we're doing a terrible job at these cases. So these are the statistics statewide, just for the adult charges. I left the juvenile. Um, stats out of these numbers, but for 2017 and 2018, the number across the state of Oregon, uh, this is from, from the Judicial Department, how many charges, not necessarily that it's the individual charge, but how many times have, have, has a prosecutor's office charged strangulation? How many times have we gotten a conviction for that? How many of those charges have been dismissed? Some have some other dispositions, those could be um, uh, deferred sentencing type programs, which I have some very strong negative opinions about, but I'll leave that for the moment, um, and then some that are still pending. So if we're looking at 2017, when we filed 972 felony strangulation charges, we have 320 convictions for those. We're at a 33% conviction rate for felony strangulations, a 29% conviction rate for misdemeanor strangulations. That's terrible. Um, and when we're looking at 2017, I mean, our dismissal rate for strangulation charges is over 55%. And some of those cases, granted, are still pending. Some of those, those charges may have been dismissed pursuant to negotiations where we have other types of charges that may be plugged in on those. But even at that, that suggests that um, we're not recognizing, and I say we as prosecutors in general are not recognizing the seriousness of strangulation to say there has to be a plea to the strangulation charge not just the assault or not just something else. If we're dismissing strangulation, we're really not, even pursuant to negotiations, appreciating the seriousness of these offenses. Um, for 2018, obviously there's still a lot of those cases that are in pending status, so those numbers aren't perhaps as, as strong, but even at that, I mean, our, our dismissal rates, are, our conviction rates are painfully low. I mean, that's not what that should be. When we're looking at at strangulation, I mean, I had, a, I had a prosecutor tell me early on in my career, our conviction rate should be close to 100%, which is maybe a little uh, hopeful. But the idea being, from a prosecutor's perspective, we're in charge of what's being filed. We're in charge of what's being presented in the courtroom. And so there shouldn't be these circumstances where, where these, these, these cases are having such a low um, conviction rate. And, and with that, I'll also say there's a caveat, I think, when it comes to domestic violence cases, because while we're in charge of what charges are being filed, there's a lot that we can't control over the course and the life of a domestic violence case, right? I'm not, <laughs> did, did DV work for 13, did DV prosecution strictly for 13 years now? I'm not um, oblivious to that. But so this is, we have to fix this. This, this, is, this is a problem. And so, there's also a huge connection between strangulation and lethality and the recidivism that we see within domestic violence. Um, as Mary mentioned this morning, um, you're much more likely to be a victim of homicide down the line if there's strangulation in the past. And one of the huge things about, I would say about strangulation is it's often used not just because the defendant actually intends to kill the victim in that moment, but to show the victim that he can. It's this power and control dynamic, this I have your life literally in my hands. I decide, I control if you live or die. And it's that fear component, that control component that is so integral to these relationships in and of themselves 
and you plug the strangulation piece in it, into it, and of course that becomes even more extreme. Um, in a Chicago study, 57 domestic violence homicides show that 53 of 53 percent of them um, had previously been strangled in the preceding year, and 18 of those killed had been strangled to death. So not only was that their history of strangulation, but in fact, strangulation was the mechanism of their homicide, of their murder. 45% um, of female domestic violence victims of attempted murder and 43% of female domestic violence murder victims had been um, strangled in the year before, as sort of an overarching study, not just this 57%. Um, in, in, the, in past studies that have been done, so this one was from 2011, the determination was that victims of prior strangulation are seven times, and we were talking 700% more likely um, to become a homicide victim. There was actually an article in the Register Guard, which is the Lane County uh, newspaper. If you just Google strangulation register guard, something like that, it'll probably pop up right away. It was just earlier this week that the stat now is that you are 10 times more likely um, of becoming a homicide victim if there's strangulation in the past. It is absolutely one of the best predictors of a future homicide. Um, when they're looking at what the risk factors are, um, Strangulation and the history of it is, is noted as one of the top five. Um, Dr. Jacqueline Campbell has put together a danger assessment that some of you may be familiar with in looking at um, intimate partner uh, violence relationships and what types of risk factors uh, might exist in these relationships. And if we start to look at the lethality piece there, um, there's 20 questions total. Number 10 is, did he ever try to strangle you? I think the question actually originally said choke, again, sort of moving into this different language. Excuse me. Um, and it, the San Diego study um, on strangulation, which I'll reference a couple times during this presentation, um, found specifically that 89% of these strangulation cases also had a history of abuse. So the history of abuse makes it more likely that someone will be strangled. The history of strangulation makes it more likely that, we, that somebody will become murdered. <clears throat> um, I think this was already in this morning's. 34% um, of abused pregnant women report that they've been strangled, um, and victims often show that um, victims of multiple strangulations often have this, this ongoing um, medical sort of development that occurs. I just read an article the other day about sort of this movement amongst radiologists um, within hospitals to start looking more specifically at signs and symptoms of potential history of strangulation and abuse within their radiology scans. The study that was being developed was the, this sort of consideration of X number of cases that had come into a particular hospital over a number of years. And looking back at those scans, not just for what the radiologist was actually looking for, what the purpose of that scan was, but to start re looking at, is there this history of, of this abuse, which could become um, very helpful. So how do we improve those horrific stats at the beginning, right? So a couple things. I think, one, we understand the act of strangulation, to really comprehend what that is. Not just the, okay, it typically involves somebody's hands around someone else's throat. But what other ways do we get to to strangulation? How bad is that really? What are the long-term risks to the victim? Not just in that moment, but when you're talking about victims like Alice from this morning that have these ongoing medical issues for months, years afterwards that become permanent um, changes to their person, or the risks that exist in, in victims that develop based on those internal injuries, a variety of other pro medical problems over the years that sometimes result in death weeks and months later after the initial um, strangulation. Understanding what the case law is um, and what the new amendments are to the strangulation statute, there's some changes that have occurred in Oregon over the last couple of years. And again, I would say that's relevant not just for the prosecutors in the room and not just for law enforcement, but for everyone as you're educating the community about what does this mean, what effect does this have, as the legislature has finally started to recognize just how serious this is. Um, momentarily playing aside, I'm going to make a comment being video recorded. Um, but, you know, I think I, for years there have been, long since before I was even a lawyer, there have been efforts to increase the, the penalties that are attached to strangulation. Up until 
2000, I want to say 15, I think, it, was, it wasn't even a felony under any circumstance. It was just a misdemeanor offense. And a lot of that, that pushback has been, well, it's going to cost a lot of money for us to put people in prison on felony strangulation charges. It's going to cost a lot of money for us to house them. Well, yes, it is. It's also going to cost a lot of money when we're looking at these victims that have these significant medical issues or these homicides that are happening when we're not recognizing the severity of strangulation. And so, and I think it was in 2014-15, the legislature made some movement towards, in certain circumstances, it's a felony case, and we've made some additional movements that took effect um, this January, January of 2019, so we'll talk about that. What that case law means and and educating sort of the, the community as a whole all the way up to our judicial branches to understanding what that means and what those threats actually are. Um, improving police investigations in terms of asking questions, um, including the, the medical personnel and the EMTs that are paramedics that are on scene and involved, what's happening at the hospital. I mean, everything, I say police investigations, but there's a lot that I would say falls under that umbrella. Really, I'm just talking about criminal investigations. Maybe that's a better word for it. Um, training officers, and, and with that, I'll also include prosecutors, the investigations, the prosecutions, the developments of these cases, how they're presented within a courtroom, how they're explained to a jury, which goes then directly to training and using officers and other community personnel um, to do follow-up and to testify as experts in strangulation cases. Um, so we're going to talk about some of those things. So, um, first step, uh, the statute under Oregon law. Under 163-187, strangulation is defined as a person commits the crime of strangulation if the person knowingly impedes the normal breathing or circulation of the blood of another person by applying pressure on the throat, neck, or chest of the other person or blocking the nose or mouth of the other person. So this in and of itself, just as it stands right here, remains under Oregon law a class A misdemeanor. The changes that happened in 2019 was that we added this language of or chest. Um, I can't remember the medical term. Crush asphyxia. Crush asphyxia. Um, Mary used this morning, but that's the idea of somebody you know, sitting on somebody's chest. It prevents them from breathing. But until January 1st of 2019, that wasn't contemplated in our statutes. Um, thankfully that has changed. And so this also, by, by this definition, what we're talking about when it comes to strangulation is more, far more, than hands around the neck. That is one way of doing it. But it can be the pressure on the chest. It can be the pressure, obviously, on the throat itself, so up in here, um, or blocking the nose or mouth. So the pillow on a face and holding it there is strangulation. That's often a place where victims, will, it won't even occur to them that he strangled me because that's not what somebody typically thinks of, of I was strangled. And so when we get to talking about t the types of questions to ask, if you get a no response to did he strangle you, the better question really is at any time were you unable to breathe from any other mechanism, right? Um, so that's the basic strangulation. What we got a couple years back was this increase to under certain circumstances, a strangulation is a felony in Oregon. If it happens in the presence of or is witnessed by the minor child of either party or one living in the home, a victim who is under the age of 10, if the offender used or attempted to use a dangerous or deadly weapon, um, if, there is a pri if the offender has a prior conviction, and this was huge, for assault, strangulation, or menacing, assault in any degree, strangulation or menacing with the same victim or a statutory equivalent in another state, the second one then became a felony. Um, or if the offender has three or more prior convictions for assault in any degree, menacing or strangulation or statutory equivalents in another state, we're then looking at offense number four, essentially, if it's a strangulation, becomes a felony. Um, if the, uh, the, the, sorry, the strangulation occurs with the offender knowing the victim is pregnant. So in any of those circumstances, it raises to a felony. I have level six felony down here, which essentially only, probably only means something to the prosecutors in the room. But we have, Oregon has a felony sentence, and I won't get, I won't get too deep in the weeds, I promise. Um, but Oregon has a felony sentencing guideline structure, and every felony in the state of Oregon is assigned a crime seriousness. 
So even that, which is a step beyond, is it a class C, B, or A felony? It goes a little further than that. So for example, um, the old possession of methamphetamine and the now new version of it is a level one. A unlawful use of a weapon is a level six. Both an unlawful use of a weapon and a possession of, of methamphetamine are both C felonies, but they have very different classifications as far as crime seriousness. The practical effect of that is, does somebody potentially look at a prison sentence, is the sort of short version of that. And this version of felony strangulation becomes a level six. So depending on a person's criminal history, they very well may be looking at a prison sentence based on this type of a strangulation. Um, the modification that happened, um, adding it uh, in January, is that we now have a set, a, a, another subsection of, you have that first version, that misdemeanor version, plus if the victim is a family or household member, then it becomes a felony. That means, effectively, that every intimate partner relationship, uh, every intimate partner domestic violence strangulation is now a felony. This is huge, huge. Where we didn't get everything we wanted <laughs> um, was that it became a level five felony. So it was, it's classified a little lower uh, than the other versions of felony strangulation. Um, in a lot of circumstances, depending on criminal history, it still can mean prison. It's a lesser prison sentence. Um, and you have to have a more significant criminal history before we get to prison as a level five. Um, so it's not yet an ideal circumstance but it's at least a step in the right direction, I'll say, of the legislature recognizing, yes, um, this, is, this is one, serious, and two, we're seeing it more frequently within the intimate partner um, um, domestic violence type cases, and so we need to recognize these a little bit differently. Um, so questions about any of that? Okay. Um, so just in terms of defining some of these things, what does it mean? So under the felony version of witnessed by um, witnessed by a child or occurs in the immediate presence of the child, the eligible child for this purpose has to be a child of either the victim or the defendant, a stepchild of either the victim or the defendant, or a minor child that's living within the home. This is one of those things that makes me a little bit nuts, because I think, okay, so the grandchild that's visiting, um, we're not protecting that child the same way we would if it was the actual biological or stepchild of the, of the family, or the neighbor kids, kids that are over, or something like that. But it does, in terms of the impact on children as a whole, the, the goal here, the definition here of child is, is that is somewhat limited. Immediate presence means that it's within the uninterrupted space. So if it happens in different rooms of the house, the immediate presence will not count. Um, the immediate presence portion of the statute, I think, is intended a little more to capture um, those minors that are unable to articulate what it is that they may be witnessed. So the infant that's laying on the bed um, when this, is, this strangulation occurs in the bedroom, the infant is in the immediate presence of this incident happening. And so we don't need the infant to somehow testify that they saw what occurred, um, but that the, the, um, we can get testimony in other ways to articulate that. And then witnessed is to see or directly perceive in any manner. So then when we're talking about different rooms, if you do have an older child who's able to articulate, I heard the slamming, I heard the gasping, I heard whatever it was that was going on, able to articulate in any way um, that they've perceived what is occurring that counts as witness for purposes of the felony determination. Under that definition of, when I said family, if, if it meets the family or household definition, that it becomes a, a felony. Um, this is what Oregon law outlines that as. It's spouses, it's former spouses, it's persons who are cohabiting together, I'll get back to that, persons who have cohabited together in the past, who have been involved in a sexually intimate relationship, unmarried parents of a minor child, or adult persons related by blood or marriage. Um, what I'll say first about these former spouses and persons who have cohabited or who have been in a sexually intimate relationship, notice there is no time limit. It doesn't have to have been a relationship within the last two years, it could have been 10 years ago. That doesn't, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that doesn't matter. What, you're, what you are able to gather in your investigation is what defines that. Um, adult persons related by blood or marriage, um, so when we're talking there, and this is a frustration that I've, I've run into a number of times now with the juvenile department, the 16-year-old who strangles his mother 
is not technically, I mean, is, isn't legally, by legal statute, it is not a family or household member um, because they are not adult persons related by blood or marriage. That doesn't mean that it isn't a bad circumstance, that we shouldn't be looking at the DV um, sort of components of it when we're dealing with sort of assessment and treatment and probation conditions and that, that sort of thing. But just as far as what are we defining as family or household member, keep in mind that that actually doesn't, doesn't fit. Um, in terms of the word cohabitate, which may have been the next thing you jump to, but they cohabitate together, um, this, the courts have defined cohabiting as persons living in a relationship, li living together in a relationship akin to that of spouses. Um, and so the idea here is they're somehow sharing finances or sharing something in a way that, that attributes it to a relationship. This is not roommates, this is not the mother and child that are living within the same household. Strangulation is a mandatory arrest. If an officer has probable cause for strangulation between family or household members, that's that the mandatory arrest law applies. One of the questions I very often get so if, take, for example, the situation of the 16-year-old um, who strangles mom, right? It doesn't, because it doesn't fall under that definition of family or household members, um, it, doesn't become, quote, it doesn't become mandatory arrest in that sense. But what do we know about strangulation, right? It's real dangerous. So should we be leaving that child in that household ongoing? Um, probably not. So just because it isn't a mandatory arrest doesn't mean that you can't arrest, that officers can't arrest, or in fact that you shouldn't arrest. That decision should absolutely always and every time um, be made um, on, a, on a safety determination. One of the things that is included in the mandatory arrest statute is this determination of who is the primary aggressor. Uh, or I think the, the term, that's the term in Orient, the term Mary used this morning was dominant aggressor. Same idea though. Um, of who, who was the actual assailant. Um, officers in Oregon are not required to arrest both. That's specifically outlined in, in, the, um, in the statute. And from a prosecutor's standpoint, it's really, really hard when the officers do arrest both because then what you've done is essentially sent them both in with a self-defense claim. That's not to say that it couldn't be a, there couldn't be a circumstance where a dual arrest is absolutely appropriate. Um, the example I always use is a case while I was at the coast um, um, where this poor eight-year-old neighbor boy, again, not a, not a child of the, of the parties, right, but who's sitting on his porch and watches this whole ordeal go down. And what he ultimately is able to talk about is this woman runs after this guy with a, with a broom handle, a broken off broom handle, and just takes chunks out of his side. And there's sort of a break in all his behavior, and he takes a big plywood board and drops it on her toes. Her toes came to the hospital in a, in a Ziploc bag. So that is a circumstance where there wasn't this like back and forth or somebody was a primary aggressor in that regard or there was some sort of a defensive action. Both of those people just needed to be arrested for assault, right? But that's not, that's different than this. Um, there's, there's a lot that goes into determining who the primary aggressor is, including what that history of that violence and that abuse might be, um, including the size, the strength, the bulk of the parties, the relative severity and extent of the injuries, you, if, one of the things I always, when I do a lot of law enforcement training, talk about is if you were to walk away right now, who do you think is more likely to end up subsequently injured? I mean, considering that type of component, the fear component. So, um, you know, Mary described this scene with a machete and this woman who's hysterical. Oftentimes, it is the person who has been victimized that is undergoing this stress and is the hysterical individual, right? Whereas you have this individual on the other side who perpetrated the violence, who is cool as a cucumber. Um, a training video that I will not subject you to because it is, was painfully made in the 80s, um, essentially outlines um, kind of a, it goes through sort of a number of visuals of, of a relationship that's going on within, within a particular household. The type of controlling behavior, how much did you spend on that dress, I can't believe you spent that money on that dress, sort of this series of incidents that finally results in him being very angry that she purchased a particular dress and advancing towards her. And in the video, as he advances towards her, he starts taking large rings off of his hand and puts them on the table and continues to advance towards her. He has made no actual physical contact with her yet at that point, and she picks up an ashtray, I told you it was the 80s, picks up an ashtray and, and hits him in the head with it. 
And the police then arrive at the scene, and so they show, in this video, show the scene of, you know, the police arriving, and he shows up at the door, and he's got a big old gash on his forehead, and is bleeding, and he says, she hit me in the head with an ashtray. And they ask her what happened, and she says, I hit him in the head with an ashtray. Well, if you stop your investigation there, who was, who was, who's getting arrested, right? Right, she is, I mean, there's, there's no question to that. But as the officer in, in this video sat down and delved into the history with her, she was able to describe that there had been a series of assaults over the course of their relationship. She had tried calling the police on a number of occasions and she was never successful in anything being prosecuted or anything being investigated, anything being done about things. And there was one time in which he hit her in the face and his ring left a mark on her, on her face. And that was the only time anything ever happened to him, the only time there was ever a consequence. And so subsequently, he was very careful to take his rings off and remove them before he would assault her. And she knew that. So the act of him taking off the rings in that circumstance was the aggressive action, was the movement towards that assault that resulted in her then defending herself in that circumstance. So it really requires a digging into what that history is. And that's, I mean, I'll admit it's hard when you're doing that type of investigation or trying to figure out those facts when, I mean, I, I certainly have been in that position. I know law enforcement is in that position all the time when you say, tell me what happened. Well, three years ago, his mother, right? Then you're like, oh my God, <laughs> we're going, we're going to, we're about to do three years of history here. Like, I need to know what happened right now before I can talk about anything. But that is the context to what happened here. And so that becomes a very difficult, don't, don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to suggest that, that, that everyone has the resources to then start talking about what happened three years ago all the way up, right? But consider what that information is and how that's going to become relevant to what it is that you're doing right now. Um, and then very um, importantly, looking at the existence of what are offensive and defensive wounds, really starting to consider and look at and look for um, what those injuries might look like. Um, there's a lot of, uh, initially I put all the questions up here and I thought, well, that's not helpful. Um, what am I going to do, read through them? And so um, one of the handouts, and hopefully everybody should have three handouts for me. One is a PowerPoint, one has kind of a signs and symptoms of strangulation, and one is entitled investigating strangulation questions, the questions to ask. Does everybody have those? I have more if somebody doesn't have them. Um, so the investigating strangulation cases, the questions to ask, I literally copied this straight from an article from Gail Strack. Um, um, the, the link is on here for the full article. Um, it's, I don't know, probably 20 pages-ish long. And it's actually a very interesting article and just in terms of understanding strangulation. It's a lot of what you've heard today um, and the things to look for. But these just go through a list of questions that absolutely can be used in every discipline in this room. Um, very helpful in terms of the initial investigation, I think very helpful for purposes of medical, EMT, paramedic, helpful for the hospital in determining what is the risk and the extent of the strangulation. Um, these are questions that can be asked when interviewing a victim prior to putting it together for a trial, in grand jury, during a trial. All of these questions are, are um, relevant in terms of determining the manner and extent of the strangulation, um, identifying both visible and the non-visible injuries, um, what the symptoms and signs of strangulation, which I'm going to get into is for purposes of a lot of investigations and prosecutions are absolutely key in us being able to continue to prosecute these cases. The types of evidence that we can gather, um, really starting to sort of jump, uh, jump, um, what's the word I'm looking for, to sort of, um, predict what the defenses are potentially going to be and to collect the evidence and, and get the information so that we can um, circumvent the, the claims and defenses that a defendant potentially comes up with later or a victim who is no longer um, in a position to cooperate and is recanting for any variety of reasons that we can still get to holding the offender accountable um, and eliminating those defenses. So I won't read through, through these um, I'll probably reference some of these questions kind of as we go through a little bit. So questions to ask in every sort of domestic violence case, circumstance, investigation, contact, I would say, um, is, is, and I think I mentioned this earlier, did the suspect at any point keep you from breathing normally? Not just did the, did the offender ever strangle you or choke you, um, 
but did, was there ever an impairment of your breathing? And not just at this time, but has there ever been a history of that? Um, really starts to give some insight to what these circumstances are. There's a lot of things that can be done um, in terms of documentation um, of the, in these cases that becomes really important as we go down the line. Um, there's, I've included in the sort of middle of this packet, there's a couple of different um, checklists. Mary had one in hers this morning as well. Um, there's this strangulation assessment card that the um, Alliance for Hopeless Training and Strangulation Institute has put together. This is the front and back of this card that kind of goes through signs and symptoms, a checklist, what is the circumstance. Um, there's an example from the Austin Police Department. This is, they've been using this since 2015 that goes a little bit more specifically, what are some of these signs and symptoms that are really helpful? Has there been a loss of consciousness? That all go towards these questions of the non-visible, typically the non-visible injury. Um, how, how long do you think you were strangled for? How were you strangled? Um, what was said during the strangulation? Um, those types of questions are really helpful. The back has um, a little graphic on it as well in terms of um, locations of types of those types of things. There's another example in here from the Mercer County Prosecutor's Office um, that they put out that also is kind of used in that way um, with what I think is actually a really funny reminder that I, I assume they created this for law enforcement. Reminder, all statements by a defendant are admissible, therefore all relevant statements should be documented. Okay, um, <laughs> it's true, it is an accurate statement. I just think it's funny that it's on that form. Um, and so there's a lot in terms of movement and, um, and, and sort of a push towards agencies. And, and I know that law enforcement agencies sort of shudder at the thought of I have to fill out another form, right? I get it. I know that's always sort of a, a struggle. Um, but in, in terms of using some sort of a checklist, I think a lot of agencies have some sort of a domestic violence checklist of some sort. Um, some agencies, perhaps it might be helpful to modify that checklist in a way to specifically include questions about strangulation. So not necessarily creating a whole new form in its entirety, but maybe looking at does the form you currently have have room for it to add some of these um, strangulation specific questions. Um, requiring a follow-up investigation within 24 hours of an incident is a great policy to have. I don't know of many law enforcement agencies that have that as a policy in place. That would be my dream as a prosecutor. Um, one of the things in Oregon that some of you may or may not be aware of is that when there is a domestic violence case, there is an exception for prosecutors down the line in terms of how we get evidence in. We get, um, so when we're talking about hearsay statements, so statements that the victim, let's say, made to the law enforcement officer, those typically would be considered hearsay and would not be admissible. We would have to have the victim in the courtroom to testify to those things. There is an exception under Oregon law that the statements a victim of domestic violence makes to a law enforcement officer within 24 hours of the domestic violence incident, we potentially get in. There's some other hurdles that we have to come overcome that I won't bore you with, but that's a huge thing. That's, that's a huge location where we might get excellent evidence and statements and information that deal with the, the motives and the bias and the reasons for recanting and all those things but we have 24 hours to get it. So oftentimes, you know, when law enforcement officers are contacted with sort of a, hey, I need this follow-up and I need it now, um, the reason for that is because we have this limited time frame. And that's sort of the idea behind this, if there's a policy in place to try to get follow-up investigation with 24, within 24 hours, that's huge. It's not just that we want follow-up photos and additional information, but if we get, which is helpful at any time, but if we get it within that 24-hour time frame, that can be um, a huge help to the prosecution's case. And then this idea, again, some, some locations have um, policies a little more set in place with this, but things to think about in terms of creating a threat assessment evaluation. There's actually, um, within these cases, there's um, a proposal within the legislature right now. I'm not sure how far it'll go, but there is a proposal um, currently pending that would require law enforcement officers within every domestic violence arrest that they make to perform, in fact, a threat assessment. Um, there's a lot of sort of unknowns in this, in this House bill as it currently exists, as far as, well, threat assessment based on what, who makes that threat assessment, that, so there's a lot of sort of questions still. But it's, it's becoming more of a sort of topic of conversation, I'll, I'll say, that it, that's pushing sort of this issue um, into more of a re potential requirement. 
Um, and also documenting not just the things that you're doing at that time, whether it's as um, paramedics at the scene or uh, medical professionals at the scene or law enforcement at the scene, but also documenting within that who might have additional information. Um, I don't know a ton, I know very little actually about your DA's office here, um, like the resources they potentially have in doing some of their own follow-up investigation, but sometimes it's just a question of getting the name of the neighbor who says, oh, I hear this happen all the time. Just the name and that this is the quick information so that somebody else knows to go back and get that information later. Because I certainly have had conversations with officers in, in multiple jurisdictions that I've worked in um, that has said, oh, I talked, there was somebody out front of the house that said, yeah, they hear like the banging against the wall all the time. I can't remember what that person's name was. I'm not, it might have been a neighbor, it might have been her cousin, I'm not, you know, and it's like, well, cool. Um, you know, what am I going to do with that information? So even if it's just a minimal, if you don't have the opportunity to get all the details right then and there, but name, date of birth, good contact information, don't rely on what may be in your local system that may be outdated. Um, uh, and so somebody can follow up on that later. And that's true not just for me. I think that the, the quick reference point is where there are witnesses to the incident. In most, most circumstances, we don't have witnesses to, to DV incidents. Um, but it may not be people that are witness to this specific incident, but witness to the relationship, or witness to the circumstances, or witnesses to the history um, that may have that. If victim says, I went to the hospital twice because of this in the past, Great, what hospital? Do you remember the name of the doctor you saw? Get that information, because victim likely is not gonna be in a position to want to tell prosecutors that later down the line, right? But if you get that information up front, potentially we can either get, an even better, get a signed medical waiver right away to that information, that's super gold star. But even if we don't have that, potentially we can subpoena those medical records down the line and get that information. But I can't send out a subpoena to all the hospitals in the state of Oregon and hope that somebody is, is, is going to have that information. I'm going to need something much more specific. So thinking about that type of history and what, what information we might be able to gather down later. Um, paramedic response. Um, I don't think this is, this is not in your, um, in your handout because as the question came up this morning, I added it. Um, but one of the big things about paramedics are huge. Some of the information that you're able to gather as, as the first on the scene or the first to make contact and to assist and help a victim who is in pain, is afraid, can't breathe, whatever the circumstances are, is enormous when it potentially comes to a prosecution. Um, getting, making sure that your information, and I, I think typically you're probably not writing reports, right? That's not happening, is that fair? Or is that happening? Well, we write a patient report. Okay. Okay. We write a patient report. Okay. Okay. So, getting, getting, making sure that the law enforcement that potentially arrives on scene has your name, knows who, what paramedics were on scene, what paramedics did what, um, and you know, if you're probably small enough of a community that you don't need it, but if you know, if there's circumstances of like what unit you're with or what what dispatch unit or something like that you're with, having that information. Um, in those reports because same circumstance, I've had conversations with officers that say, well, the paramedic came up and told me, you know, victim was, wouldn't stop holding her head because it hurt so bad. Great, that's fantastic information. Which paramedic? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Can you figure it out? Uh, probably not. And again, you're maybe a small enough community that that doesn't become a thing, but just keeping those things in mind because that information is huge. If the paramedic has that information or has those, and again, as far as ability to prosecute down the line, there's information that you are gathering that we can potentially use that we don't get in any other way. Because you are treating, you are asking questions and doing things to treat for a medical purpose, that potentially allows hearsay statements in for you to be able to say the victim told me her head was throbbing or that she couldn't see straight or any variety of things that we can have you testify to down the line where maybe the victim doesn't even have to be at a trial. Um, I mean, this, this same idea of evidence-based prosecution is very strong within Oregon, within, the, within domestic violence prosecution. We want to be able to prosecute offenders and protect victims whether or not um, victims are willing or able to participate in prosecutions down the line. And we do it all the time, right? I mean, we prosecute on, a, on the regular cases where a victim doesn't show up for trial, right? What cases are those? I don't have a lint roller to give you. What cases are those? Victim doesn't show up for trial. 
murder, homicide victims. They don't come, but we still prosecute those, right? I mean, one of the things that I, I, I talk about a lot is if we handle, and I'm not so delusional as to think that this is, this is resource-wise reality, right? But if we handle domestic violence investigations, all of them, not just strangulation cases, but all domestic violence investigations, with the thought process of how would you investigate a homicide case, we are collecting the right kind of evidence from every perspective. Those are the, that's the type of evidence that we need in order to prosecute cases with or without the victim. So, I'll hop off my, I'm not gonna hop off my soapbox, that's a lie. <laughs> um, I'm gonna stay right there. So the photographs, I think it's a great idea. If, if medical, if there's photographs being taken from medical, I love that, becomes part of the patient file. Um, if you can tell the officer took photographs, you know, this is who I am, be sure to get my name, and um, here's our, you know, if you just have copies of your medical release, get those signed right away. Um, having the officer talk to victim, will you sign this medical so I can get the photos that the paramedic took? At that moment, victim is far more likely to be cooperative and to say yes with that information. If you wait 40, 48, 72 hours, or we have the victim coming in for grand jury and are now asking that, we'll be told to pound sand, I would say 80% of the time. And so getting that information up front is huge. Um, and as we go through all of this, putting information into your report, particularly as law enforcement, as paramedics, um, as any sort of personnel that has regularly gets training within a how to investigate um, and, and work on gather information regarding domestic violence cases, include that information in your report. I mean, it's every Dewey investigation that an officer does, right? You include, based on my training and experience, the person was under the influence of intoxicants based on one, two, three, four, five things. You get to do the same thing here. So I will read this, um, and, and you don't have to like write exactly this, right? But this is just the idea. I've been a patrol officer for five years, and that time I've investigated 500 domestic violence cases. In many of those cases, victims have reported being strangled. I have received training in domestic violence and in particular, the medical signs and symptoms of strangulation. Based on my training and experience, I know strangulation can cause serious injury. Unconsciousness can occur within seconds. Death can occur within minutes. The symptoms and injuries as reflected in this investigation are consistent with someone being strangled. Right? Those things are, those matter. This type of testimony to a jury matters. Not just I came out to the scene and a victim said, yeah, I was strangled. I mean, I, the, a line out of a police report that still gives me nightmares is victim told me she was strangled, but I didn't see any marks. And I didn't see any marks, fine, but certainly not but. Um, and so this type of information and, and telegraphing to the prosecutors or to whatever the next step is of the process that you have this training and experience, I mean this training right here today, you have training um, based on the medical science and symptoms of strangulation and what that means and what impact that has is a lot of information and is what jurors need to understand. I mean, you're here because this is kind of a weird, nuanced type of case, right? This is a weird medical circumstance where very often victims don't have any vis uh, visible signs of this impact, but we're here training you to get other things to look for. So we can't expect the jurors just know all this information. They have to be taught this information by the prosecutor, by the witnesses on the stand, whether that's law enforcement, whether that's a paramedic, whether that's bringing in a nurse um, that worked on the case or didn't. That part actually doesn't matter. We're gonna talk more about that. <laughs> um, photographs and video, certainly photographs of the scene documenting the location, any evidence of a struggle, any evidence of any sort of uh, corroboration of the information when victim says, you know, I was, I was passed out and I woke up and I urinated myself. Photographs of the, the you know, soiled bed sheets or her clothing, ideally seizing that information, um, um, getting all of that, that type of thing, that video that we saw at the end was sort of the things being knocked off as she's you know, trying to keep from being strangled. Photographs of what that scene looks like, but for her being able to, and again, the questions that you're asking, being able to explain, I was grabbing at anything I could in an effort to get him to stop or to brace myself away from him. Um, comparison photos are great. Um, you know, is there neck swelling or anything that, that might be visible? And maybe it's not clearly neck swelling at that time, but if you take pictures of the neck at the scene 
and then 24, within the next 24 hours make another contact or make contact in 48 hours or the prosecutor now has this victim in for grand jury and the neck, the photos of the neck that the prosecutor have clearly do not look the same as the, as the person who's now walking in to testify. It's a great opportunity to take a second set of photos and be able to show her neck at the time of the incident was swollen compared to now. So sometimes that comparison photo is a comparison right away. You know, it might be one hand is swollen and the other isn't type of thing. Um, and it may be a take photos now in order to compare with something later. Um, photographs of the victim, including um, her demeanor, her level of fear, um, any visible injuries or marks, evidence that certainly <laughs> exists, but potentially also evidence of those other signs or symptoms, like I said, with a, um, urination or defecation, that type of thing. Um, or if, if somebody vomited, it would also be included. Uh, those follow-up photographs, potentially a, a photo or a video of the demonstration of the strangulation. There's some comments on, um, on this uh, questions piece in terms of caution not to reapply pressure to the victim's neck. Please, please, please don't recreate it on the victim. Um, that is very uh, trauma, re-traumatizing to the victim. Um, photographs of the suspect, including any claims that the suspect may make as far as what injuries he may or may not have. So photographs if there are injuries, photographs if there are not injuries, all of the, there should always be photographs. Um, and what is shown, um, to see something else about this. Oh, and then in terms of video, you know, sometimes that might be helpful. I don't know if any, if any of the agencies here have body cams. Um, so sometimes that information is helpful. Capturing that information on a body cam might be um, helpful. Also what that demeanor is um, and how a victim is talking um, might, be, might be very beneficial down the line. You know, sometimes it's capturing pain. I mean, there's some swollen injury and that type of thing as well, but it's also what the pain is. I mean, what, what that victim is currently going through. And this, was, this photograph was taken um, of this victim at least 24, if not 48 hours later, she came in to come get a restraining order. Um, and, and so you can kind of see that it's just that the action of moving her neck is very clearly painful. <clears throat> um, these were photographs while she was in the hospital the night of, but then follow-up photographs give you very different indication. Sort of a little blaze right here. So here there's not much, if any, I mean, there's very little maybe bruising on her neck that's visible here, not a whole lot. Clearly that's developed quite a bit more. She's got quite a bit more bruising on her face and certainly on her eyes. Um, and and this, this sort of day after um, petechial, uh, petechia is also showing very differently than, so, I mean, it's, you can see it here, but it's different when she has a very red face to what it looks like the following day. Um, and so certainly there will be, in some circumstances, there will be visible injuries that you can photograph and look for in these, these cases. And in the worst of the worst, I'm not even going to say that. That's not, I was going to say the worst of the worst strangulation cases, you'll see that. That's not, that's not true. Um, there are cases, one of the absolutely worst <laughs> strangulation cases where victim lived that I have seen in my career, um, and it's, it was a coworker of mine's case. Um, she, let me just back up a little. When I was on the, in Lane County on the DV team, um, we had folks come in for restraining orders in, um, to, vic to the DA Victim Services Program. And this gal came in, and our services provider, our, our director came into the office to myself and um, one of my colleagues and said, I don't know how this girl's alive. Like, you have to come see this girl. I don't, I, she, and we said, well, what case is it? You know, which one of our intakes is it this morning? You don't have it. Well, did nobody get arrested? No, somebody got arrested. So we go over to see this girl, and she had like the color of your jacket, the color of my jacket, black eyes. You could not see her pupils. Her face was completely, I mean, it was, it was just, I unfortunately don't have permission to use those photos, otherwise they would have been in here. But she, I mean, she looked like death. I mean, I, I don't have any other description for it. And she described what had happened, that she had been strangled by this guy that she had met on a dating, dating website, had gone out with two or three times. He wanted her to stop talking, and he just kept strangling her, and strangling her, and strangling her, and strangling her. And she would wake up, and he would strangle her again. And um, she had urinated herself. She had defecated herself. She had thrown up, um, and um, she was able to ultimately get out of the house. 
and um, was able to call 911. Police arrived and responded and got the information from her. And um, there were a couple of training issues that then occurred on this case, but the first was that it was considered not to be domestic violence because they had um, not been in a relationship. They had just started dating, which was wrong. That was a training issue we corrected. Um, but as a result, we had a rule in Lane County that all domestic violence cases came into circuit court. Non-domestics could go into municipal courts. And so this case was sent into municipal court as a misdemeanor strangulation. Thank God she came in for a restraining order. Um, that guy was released from the municipal jail um, because his grandma posted a $500 bail. And um, as soon as we got that information, within about four hours of him getting out of the uh, jail, the municipal jail, he was picked back up um, by one of our detectives and um, placed back in custody for attempted murder. Um, that guy's day did not go well. Um, but she, when I looked at those photos, I mean, when I looked at her when she came in, I thought, how was this not seen as something more than, than a misdemeanor on the front end? And I, she was on a Monday, and the assault, the, the strangulation had happened, I think, on a Friday or Saturday. I went and pulled the photos. She had some petechia, some red stippling right here. That was it. Wow. That was it on the original scene. I mean, I, I don't fault those. I fault them for sending it to Muni Court, but I don't fault them for not for not looking at was this more in that particular circumstance because there wasn't anything that was that visible on the front end. That guy went to prison for attempted murder. So, I mean, those, those are, and, and it was an attempted murder in that circumstance because he ultimately eventually said, the only reason I stopped is because I thought she was dead. So, um, misdemeanor strangulation, right? It's cool, guys. <laughs> um, so in terms of visible injuries, yes, sometimes they exist. Sometimes they're very minimal on the front end. Again, very important to get that follow-up and how these things develop. So things to look for are redness and scratch marks potentially gouge marks, um, and this, these, this list right here I'm giving you is on the victim and on the offender um, in terms of gouge marks or scratches. Finger marks, thumbprints, the being pushed down or held down somewhere or against a wall. Potential ligature marks, ropes or um, cord marks, chin abrasions in an effort to get away that might cause that some sort of scratching on the victim's chin, any sort of swelling, bruising, um, lumps or bumps, right? So those are things that you might you might see. Um, here, um, this victim, these marks right here, defendant says, oh yeah, she did that to herself. Did she? Maybe. 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 How? Trying to get into the right, if I'm being strangled, where am I grabbing? I am pushing those hands away as hard as I can, and that very well may mean that my fingernails end up vertically scratching my own neck. But I sure didn't like stand there in the living room and start mauling at myself, right? Um, so things to consider. This is a little bit more kind of a pinch mark that you see sort of the in, the, in between the fingers um, that that injury occurred a little bit more from that pressure. This is very, very uncommon. This is the only, this photograph is the only time at least that I've been doing these cases and run into strangulation case that I've seen something like this where you see like the delineation between each of the fingers. <clears throat> um, this is an example of that, um, when you have some of this hemorrhaging here, but this petechiae up in the eyelid, this victim is dead, do not stick four forceps in um, a live victim's face. eyeballs, please. Um, but you can see some of the petechia up in here, but like this, you wouldn't have seen but for lifting that eye up. So again, don't use, don't use pliers in someone's face, but having a victim like lift up her eye uh, might be helpful in terms of seeing if that type of injury is there. This is what I expect you to see. Absolutely nothing. This is what I expect. Um, this victim was strangled three times, um, kind of in different directions and in different ways. And she even has a necklace on. He didn't go so low as to somehow pull on the necklace to create any sort of ligature mark. He grabbed her right up in here. And so this is what I expect. This is what you should expect. This, based on your training and experience, is what you should expect to see. Um, even if there are no visible injuries, my, again, dream world would be that officers always encourage victims to seek medical treatment, regardless of whether or not there's anything visible. That if information has been provided that a strangulation or any impairment of the breathing has occurred, that they seek medical attention. Um, because of the underlying brain damage that happens in a strangulation and in any sort of impairment of that breathing, 
Um, victims have died up to weeks later. There's a, she's somewhere along the coast. Um, I think it may be north, further north coast. But there was, there's a gal who um, currently is suffering from what they call locked-in syndrome. She had been in California with her boyfriend. He had held her up against the wall with a baseball bat, had strangled her multiple times. Um, I don't think there was much in the way of sort of visible injury. It was dealt with in terms of law enforcement down in her jurisdiction in California. She came up to stay with her family up here in Oregon. And then very suddenly she just had some sort of medical um, emergency and they brought her to the hospital and she's been in this coma, in this, in this sort of awake coma, locked in, so she can hear everything, she can absorb everything, she can't move, she can't talk, she can't anything. Um, and it's a result of the strangulation that occurred. <clears throat> Um, so, the, I mentioned earlier the San Diego study um, of 300 strangulation cases that they looked at over, over a period of, of um, five years. All of the um, victims in this study that they did were female. Um, most of the suspects in these circumstances they found were employed in jobs which they primarily worked with their hands, which was sort of an interesting component. Um, a history of domestic violence existed in 90% of those cases. What they found when they looked at was there any sort of visible injury? 50% of the victims had absolutely no visible injury. They looked like that last victim with just nothing. 35% of them had injuries that were too minor to photograph. Even if the officer could potentially see with the naked eye some semblance of something, it could not be captured in a photograph. And only 15% of them had any sort of significant visible mark that could be, that could be documented in that way. So what that means is based on your training and experience, 85% of, of strangulation cases have no documentable visible injuries. That's a big deal. So again, this report that I read about, my victim said she was strangled, but I saw no injuries. Now you know why that makes me cringe, right? That doesn't, those two things do not equate. Um, this is a video from a uh, casino surveillance um, uh, camera up in Washington. Um, this woman had walked into the casino looking for help um, from somebody and the casino personnel that she initially made contact with, she was there with her boyfriend, the casino personnel um, kind of talked to her briefly and then talked to the boyfriend and the boyfriend said, oh no, no, everything's just fine and we're just going to head out and they were already kind of on their way, no, there was no um, um, sort of <coughs> further interaction that was going to occur but the person sitting up in the camera booth um, came down and said, oh no, 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 there's, the police are on their way. Walks away, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, five 1,000, six 1,000, seven 1,000, and she's out. Very kindly helps her back up. She just fell down, she's probably drunk, had too much to drink, she's just fine. I think it's interesting she pulls the guy in between them. But you know, everything was just gonna be a-okay. So what they found out later was that um, he had been doing this to her multiple times a week. There were no marks on her. I mean, if you look at how gently, you know, he got her to, 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 to let go, right? Um, and then gently takes her down to the ground. She's not gonna have any scrapes or abrasions or marks on her, right? It's just, it's not gonna happen. Um, so then when he tells this guy, oh, no, no, she just, she fell to the ground, she's fine, she's, I don't know where her problem is, whatever, right? That, that seems like a feasible explanation. Um, so Mary talked about this this morning, but in terms of the, the pressure, I just want to bring it up again here, as a reminder of the pressure that it takes to occlude somebody's ability to breathe. It's not a lot. I mean, when we're talking about 11 pounds of pressure, uh, 11 PSI, 4, and 32 for 57 seconds to potentially kill someone, um, you know, handgun trigger, 6 PSI. Does anybody have a handgun they're super proud of that has an even lower PSI? That's right. What is it? Three. Three, right? Um, <laughs> Right, but that's the point is that's <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> um, there was some, there was an exit back here, right? <laughs> um, but opening a can, I mean, if, if you didn't have a soda for lunch, help yourself to one, right? Opening that can of soda is 20 psi. 
That is more than it takes to occlude somebody's jugular or carotid arteries. A handshake, that's not a lot. There's a chart that um, Jen Sniffen used to be the uh, uh, medical examiner for Lynn Benton County. She's still working out of Benton County now. Um, and she has this chart that was like a physical therapy chart um, of what the hand pressure, the, the ability to, to sort of pull something should be at different age levels and what that, um, the, that, that um, from a physical therapy standpoint, what that should be. And when you get to the bottom of her chart, it's like an 85 year old woman is still able to do something that's higher than what it takes to, to strangle somebody. Um, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with, um, there was a case up in Portland a couple years ago, a woman's name is Susan Walters. Her husband had hired a hitman to kill her. Um, she came home, she's an, she's an amazing woman. Um, she came home one day, she and her husband had separated. Um, no law enforcement history of domestic violence. There's domestic violence that she has since reported that occurred, but none um, with it that made its way to law enforcement. She came home and a um, individual was in her house with a hammer um, to come after her to kill her. She was an emergency room nurse up in Portland and um, she managed to eventually get this guy on the ground and she strangled him to death. Um, and law uh, enforcement was able to later determine that in fact this man in her house had been hired by her husband to kill her. Um, if you just Google her name, there's a lot of interesting articles and there's videos and stuff online. Um, but again, when she was in a position and, and when she, I've, I've had the, the um, great fortune of having her speak at some events that I've put on and um, you know, she talks about it and she says, I wasn't in good shape. I wasn't, um, you know, this sort of like turbo, you know, whatever that, that is going to be in a position to where she would have thought she's going to be able to strangle someone. But that's exactly how she managed to, to not just disarm him and keep him from murdering her, but in fact killed him. Well, he beat the hell out of her too, right? I saw Yes. I saw him yes. Too. Yeah, he did, he did yeah. a good number on her before. And in part, because at one point, it was sort of a little bit off topic, but at one point she got him in a, in a chokehold and she knew, based on her training as an emergency room nurse and sort of the ability um, of what she potentially could be able to do, she finally said, tell me who you are and who sent you and I'll let you go and I'll call you an ambulance. And so she let him go briefly and that caused him to assault her even further before she managed to get him a second time. So far more important than potentially those visible injuries, or to look for what the other signs and symptoms are to document. Is there, does victim de describe any sort of neck pain? Does while you're having contact with victim, she constantly kind of roll her shoulders or try to crack her neck or um, swallow repeatedly as she's talking to you? Now, that type of a, of a not even conscious behavior on the victim's part uh, is very often going to be a much more reliable sign and symptom of, of strangulation. The hoarseness or the loss of voice. I won't play the 911 call for you again. Mary played it this morning, which was great. But I've used that same one in training. Um, you know, when the, it was actually the second one where, where um, the victim says, I don't know why I can't breathe. I don't know why I can't breathe. She has no idea what's happening to her. She just knows she cannot catch her breath. Um, and similarly, in the first one, she says, I need to take a deep breath. I need you to, to calm down, right? They can't. It's not, I mean, they may be hysterical in that sense as well, but that's not what's actually causing this circumstance right now that they aren't able to breathe. Um, and one of the things I would say, I mean, I think, well, a couple things. One is, is definitely training dispatchers is a, is a big deal, is important for that understanding on what happens on the front end. I absolutely agree. I mean, it's, I remember who made the comment this morning about, you know, dispatchers do an incredibly difficult job and are trying to gather as much information as quickly as possible to be able to relay that. Yes, they need that information, but I think what you'll hear this afternoon in terms of the trauma-informed piece is that's another place where I would love to see more training happen on a dispatcher end in terms of that trauma-informed, I don't, I don't know why you can't breathe right now, but we're, we're going to try to deal with that. We're going to send a paramedic. You know, skip the do you need a paramedic five times, right? Just the I don't know why you can't breathe. We're going to try to figure that out. We're going to send some medical treatment out to you. I'm going to try to get some of this other information. And I know that takes, in some circumstances, maybe a couple more seconds to get that out, but it creates a circumstance where the victim is maybe then more capable of giving some of that information. Um, that lightheadedness or head rush when a victim suddenly says, I think I need, I need, I need to, to sit down, right? During the conversation with you or isn't able to stand up or is leaning up against a wall the whole time. Uh, that nauseous feeling, um, asking the question about was there any loss of bodily function or did she throw up at any time or feel nauseous. That may not be something that a victim is real excited to tell you about um, because it's embarrassing. 
um, but asking those questions and thinking more in consciousness, that type of thing. Um, so obtaining the 911 tapes, this is where I normally would have played that for you, but it does have a lot of information in terms of how that victim's voice may change. Again, having some of that captured on a, a body camera video might be huge, so that a, a grand jury or a jury down the line can listen to the 911 call or to your body cam and how victim sounded and how victim potentially testifies at the trial with a very different tone of voice or ability to speak. Um, in terms of that medical attention, um, including obviously all the visible injuries, but also the non-visible injury, the pain, any sort of impairment. Um, and it, and if, it all, if at all you can, getting the medical uh, waiver signed both for the paramedics and for the hospital. Um, I have said that like three times now, but I intentionally have said that three times so that it keeps coming up that you, that's something you think about. One of the things that we did when I was in Lane County, and this may already be something that's in practice here, I don't know, is we got the, we had sort of two main medical providers and we got a very clear medical form from their records department. We went, our DA's office went through the time with their medical lawyers to go through what do you need for every part of your medical program. So we had Sacred Heart and Mackenzie Willamette. Sacred Heart, what do you need that could you possibly need? So if we use one form for all of them, what do we have to include on that one form so that we could check those things off? Because what we found ourselves running into occasionally was we would have this sort of generic, which I'm, I'm, not, a, I don't, I'm not a lawyer for a, for a hospital, right? Um, and I'm sure HIPAA has its own <laughs> nightmares. But we had what we thought was a sufficient form, and the law enforcement was having a victim sign, and then the records department would say, nope, sorry, you need a different form. Here's our form, use this one. Well, at that point, victim wouldn't sign it anymore. And so then we lost that evidence. And so doing it sort of on the front end, getting, making sure we had those two forms with all the information that we could check all of that so that our, that records department, we knew that records department was going to accept that and we were going to get what we wanted and needed. And so all of our law enforcement agencies in Lane County have the copies of those two forms and if we update it, that goes out. So um, anticipating some defenses, um, as far as during the investigations, during the contacts with victims, thinking about what the claim may be down the line, really sort of thinking through what those could be and can help in what the, um, what the investigation looks like and what types of questions are asked. So she attacked me, I was just trying to keep her from doing anything to me. How many, there, there's not a ton of law enforcement, but how many of you have ever responded to a scene where a defendant comes out and says, look at, look, she's scratching me on the chest, she just came at me and scratched me on the chest, right? That's happened, right? That's, who, who does that? Like, I'm just gonna get in a fight and come to you and just scratch you, and I'm not a cat. So, um, I mean, that, that's not what's happening. Right, scratches on the backs of hands, um, neck on the face, eye gouges to an offender, bites on the arms, arms, hands, or chest. My other favorite one is like, look, she bit me right here. Just like ran up to you and bit you right there. Um, so always asking the victim if there was any sort of physical contact between her and the defendant while she was being strangled. Um, asking questions about whether or not she was in a chokehold, potentially, um, if there was any sort of manual strangulation, if it was from the front or if it was from the back, if it was a you know, chokehold in this way, um, around her neck, again, going back to what that method and mechanism was, um, and asking the victim ultimately what made the defendant stop. So, this is a good example, right? She just came at me and mauled me. No, what happened to this guy? He was strangling his victim with a belt. And so she scratched and, and tried it with everything she had to try to get him to stop. This guy, she bit me, right here. She just ran up to me, she bit me. What really happened? He right? He had her in a headlock. Um, so common defensive injuries to the victim um, are very often injuries to the tops of the head as they try to block or um, avoid any sort of hits. Uh, injuries to the forearms or the shoulders, again, as they're trying to block. Injuries to the backs of their hands, um, or injuries to the back buttocks or the back of the legs, indicating sort of a defensive fetal position. So this is a good example of injury both to the hand. It's also a good example of a comparative photo of the swelling on one hand and, and the non-existent swelling on the other. You know, the victim comes in later. If you have just the picture of her, of her right hand, oh, I just have kind of swollen hands, or I was retaining water that day, she's not cooperative, right? But that's not the case, like that hand is swollen and you have that evidence regardless of what she later maybe says because you have that comparative photo. Um, this, a little bit difficult to see, but there's these bruises all up and down her arms and along the side right here 
Obviously, she wasn't totally successful. She's got some stitches and um, quite a shiner that went through, but those defensive injuries, offensive injuries. Um, she, you know, she caused that injury to herself, this idea of those scratch marks on the neck, documenting what the details and the circumstances were. If you ask the victim, you know, what is it that you did while he was strangling you? She's able to say, I was trying to get him to stop. I, you know, scratched his t-shirt. Oftentimes, defendants will have ripped t-shirts. It's a very common circumstance in, a, in an assault case. Um, um, or, you know, I tried to get his hands off of me or whatever the case may be. Collecting, obviously, anything that may have been used to strangle the victim, documenting that, both in photographs and collecting it. You know, I've seen some really interesting things that have been used. Um, maybe the saddest one that I've had was a baby monitor cord. Um, but the, you know, belts, clothing, scarves, dog leashes, pillows, jewelry, cords, it could be any variety of things um, that, were, that were used. Um, as we talked about earlier, in terms of the, the statutory definition, of strangulation it involves the defendant knowingly impeding the breathing so oftentimes the defense becomes well i didn't know that she couldn't breathe um, otherwise i obviously would have stopped right so that becomes very important to what the de did the defendant say at the time that this incident was happening because if he, if you get statements from the victim or from the, the defendant or whatever during the time the incident is happening i wanted her to stop talking I told her to shut up. I told her I was gonna keep going until, you know, whatever, she's, whatever, whatever. Um, I come up with a, with a million different things. Her victim says you're gonna, victim says that he told her, um, I wish you were dead or something along those lines, right? What is it that the statements were at that time? What is it that victim was feeling, was afraid of at the time? What did victim manage to say, if anything, during that time? Does the victim able to articulate, I was gasping, or I was, I was uh, uh, making sounds, or I kept trying to tell him, please stop, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. You know, the victim gives you that information, that's amazing when defendants, well, I didn't know she couldn't breathe. Because you didn't believe her? Like, you know, what? So, getting that information, if ultimately, and this is a little more for the, uh, both for law enforcement and for prosecutors, but potentially, um, if you can't get to the knowingly impede breathing, you potentially still have an assault because the assault is a physical injury, requires a physical injury, which includes either substantial pain or impairment of a physical condition, which includes the ability to breathe. Um, and for an assault, we can file it as reckless. It doesn't have to be knowing. Um, so kind of thinking creatively to what other charges do we potentially have. When defendant claims, well, I wasn't putting pressure on her throat, neck, or chest, I just kind of had my hands on her shoulders, right? I was just trying to kind of, I don't know what. So potentially, do we also get to, you know, if when we're looking at how do we hold an offender still accountable for this behavior, I go back to, it should be strangulation if we can get there, because we should accurately reflect what's happening. But in terms of um, holding an offender accountable and putting somebody into the system and documenting history, if what we have is an assault four, that's maybe not a bad thing either. Um, and this, some will bore you too much with, but essentially under, under case law, there's a lot of discussion in the concept of, in, un, under the theory of assault of what is physical injury, and for purposes of physical injury, impairment of a physical condition, um, there's a requirement that the, the impairment be material and not de minimis. So if you had a, um, if you had essentially a reckless act, but that impaired somebody's breathing, but for a split second, that probably would not amount to impairment of a physical condition. If it was knowing, and for a split second, it's still a strangulation. So there's, I mean, this is a little more for the lawyers to sort of delve out um, and detail out, right? But so there's, there's some, some somewhat competing case law in that regard that works for us in one regard and doesn't work for us in the other. This idea of, well, the defendant just put his hands over her mouth to keep her quiet or to tell her to shut up. Didn't, not, not because I was trying to impair her breathing, it was just because I was trying to do this. Sometimes from an investigation standpoint, you get some really great statements when you sort of, okay, so tell me more about that, right? That you wanted to keep her, get her to shut up. Well, maybe, I mean, it's, it's still, still very likely a strangulation in terms of a knowingly impede someone's ability to breathe, right? If, if they go far enough. But it might also be a coercion charge um, to, threaten somebody with physical injury if they don't engage in what you want them to do or do engage in something you don't want them to do, right? So trying to get somebody to be quiet, if you're not quiet, I'm going to impair your breathing, um, is a C felony that 
in that circumstance, becomes a level seven on that crime seriousness grid. So we've actually sort of jumped everything else and, and have a bit of higher um, seriousness. Um, this becomes a little less crucial since we now have within the, within the DV realm that they're all felonies, but this idea of, you know, I didn't know the victim was pregnant, so it can't be a felony under that theory. So asking multiple parties those questions, you know, not just asking defendant, did you know she was pregnant? He says, nope, didn't know. But asking victim, did he know you were pregnant? Has he gone to doctor's appointments? Has there been a discussion about baby names? Has there been, you know, whatever. Some of this additional information might be to um, be able to prove that defendant, in fact, knew about the pregnancy. Denies that there were children present. Okay, well, from an investigation standpoint, um, is there evidence of children in the home? Are, were there toys all over the place? Or is there something that, you know, that the kids just finished their snack or something in the, in the living room? Um, were there forensic interviews that were done? Should they be done? Um, in terms of witnessing uh, the domestic violence, is somebody else able to articulate victim or is someone else in the home able to articulate that there were um, um, children there? And just quickly, I'll say in terms of talking to kids, um, I know that you've got at Wallace House, I, I chatted a little bit earlier in terms of um, some ability to, to interview children that have witnessed domestic violence, um, do, doing forensic interviews of them, not just if they were actual victims of the violence themselves, which is fantastic, and you can gain a ton of information from that, and if I had more time, I would play some really great videos, snippets of you, for you of, of some of the things that children will say in those circumstances. I have one of a little boy, um, who says, and then, and then mommy couldn't breathe. Well, how do you know that mommy couldn't breathe? Because she went, <coughs> he's five, right? And then, um, just to break her heart a little further, she, he says, and then she walked down the hall and she called for God to come help her and no one would come down. And so, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot we can get from these kids um, that are able to articulate what's happening. And sometimes, I mean, if the mom is in the process of being strangled, she may not even really be able to realize how close her children are, what they are or aren't potentially observing or can observe. Um, very often it's a circumstance, so the kids are up in, up in bed, they were asleep, the kids didn't see anything. You know, the same little boy talks about, well, where were you at the time? I was hiding under my, under my blankets in my bed. And so he could hear everything that was happening. So certainly perceived, right, the, the assault that was occurring, um, but wasn't there. And sometimes it's from, a, from an advocacy perspective, I would say, you know, it's very useful in some of the, the victims that I've worked with um, who I think on some level don't want to believe that their children have been exposed to some of these things. Um, that when the time is right to sit down with them, when we do our forensic interviews in Lane County, there's the parents, nobody can be in the room or watch the video at the time. But when the time is right to sit down with the mom and watch the video so that the mom can see what the child is actually experiencing within the household, that can be very powerful. Um, and I've done, I've done the same, maybe with less good intention, um, at sentencing hearings with offenders who claim I'm, I'm a good dad and I'm a this, that, and the other. Oh, let's play the sentence, you know, let's play this video for the court and any other person from the public who wants to come in here and look and I want you to listen to what your child has experienced. Um, because there are a lot of times I think these offenders aren't aware of what they're sub actually subjecting their children to, excuse me, their children to. So um, when charging domestic violence strangulation, whether it's from a booking perspective or from a uh, charging document perspective, I would say, especially right, we have these two different levels of strangulation. Um, I think it's smart to plead in the alternative. So if you have, certainly every domestic, sort of your, if I would say, what would have otherwise been a misdemeanor, but is domestic violence, therefore is felony, obviously it just comes in under that theory as a felony strangulation. But if you have any of those other felony aggravators, so it's a domestic, but victim is pregnant, charging it as both, because one is a level six and one is a level five, um, they would merge for all purposes at the end of, of, of a case if they were done, but you want the higher crime seriousness. Same for witnessed by a child, knowing victim was pregnant, um, family or household member. So just kind of keeping that in mind. And not, don't assume that just because we now have this domestic family or household member felony aggravator that the others don't matter. They absolutely still matter. Um, and then some other charges that potentially, I was, had a rough time. I put harassment on there and deleted it, put it back, I think four or five times, because it's sort of a charge I hate. Um, because I feel like that's the fallback to, oh, we can't do anything else with this, so let's charge a harassment. 
Um, and, and in some circumstances, I would say harassment is sometimes harder actually to prosecute when all is said and done than, a, than an assault, but it has some different consequences as far as firearm ban, um, and it's a class B instead of a class A misdemeanor, but um, potentially harassment where it's offensive physical contact. If you can't get to an impairment of a physical condition and you can't get to knowing, for example, where really what you have left based on the um, evidence maybe is a shoving of the bite on the shoulders, then maybe it is a harassment. Uh, that at least gains some accountability. A menacing, placing somebody in fear of imminent serious physical injury. As you know, now based on your training and experience, um, strangulation is in fact a placing somebody in, in not just in fear of, but actually at risk of serious physical injury or death. Um, so menacing might apply potentially an assault, um, coercion, an attempted assault too, if the uh, injury is significant. Visible, the, the describable injury is significant enough. An unlawful use of a weapon if some sort of a ligature um, or other item was potentially used. Uh, there's some case law that also suggests that um, things like pavement for purposes of an assault could be a, a weapon, but things like water, so impairing somebody's breathing by blocking their nose or mouth by shoving them under water, is not just a strangulation, but also a unlawful use of a weapon. Um, which gives you another charge, and then depending on the circumstances, potentially an attempted murder. The magic question from a prosecutor's perspective on an attempted murder every single time is why wasn't it successful? So that's where that question of what made him stop can be huge. Another case that gives me absolute nightmares is one where a victim was um, pretty, I'll say, uncooperative during the course of the, um, for a variety of reasons, um, uncooperative during the course of the prosecution. It was charged as a um, strangulation was still just a misdemeanor at the time, but I had some other felony charges. We had, I'd set him up in a way where he was going to prison for an extended period of time, I want to say it was something like 80 months. Um, but she came in, she was not particularly interested in talking with me while the case was pending, but she came in at the sentencing hearing and gave a victim impact statement. And during her victim impact statement, I, I mean, I, I was stand as victims give their statements, my knees just about buckled because she said, he strangled me until he heard the sirens. That's what made him stop. And I thought, oh, shit. this was an attempted murder. And she had not, I mean, she wouldn't talk to me beforehand. So part of that was I didn't have the information, right? But I just, I, I, I mean, I can still picture where I was in the courtroom. I can picture everything about it in terms of like trauma impact, right? Like in that moment, I thought I had completely failed this person. Thankfully, he's still going to prison for a very long period of time. But that was, if I'd had that information, I would have approached that case differently. Because that was the moment where he stopped, because there was an intervening act that happened. Um, and I've had another where, when I said the, the gal with the black eyes, when he, he stopped because he thought she was dead. And I've had another that was similar to that, the one with the baby cord, he strangled her with the baby cord, and he stopped because she played dead. Um, and she, she, she was able to articulate that and said, you know, I, he just kept going and I didn't think he was going to stop. And so I just let everything go. I stopped fighting him and hoped that he would stop. And he did. And he dropped her and said, well, there you go. And walked out of the house. Which, thankfully, because she was still conscious, she was able to tell me all this information about how he walked out of the house and everything afterwards, right? But so that information is crucial um, and becomes very, very important to are we able to, um, to, to go after something like an attempted murder. Um, and then developing your strangulation experts. Um, there's a training, and I'd have to double check who puts that on, I'm not totally sure, um, but there's a training statewide that has happened I think two or three times now on developing domestic violence trial experts. If you hear about it, I would highly recommend you pick a couple people out of your jurisdiction to attend that type of a training. It teaches them how to develop their curriculum. You tie their sort of fancy resume, right? Um, with all of their previous trainings, their um, articles that they've read or, and or written, um, how they've kept up on the training and on the uh, studies that exist in a particular realm, um, and developing within your own community individuals that you can rely on to potentially um, testify at trial. I'm not going to totally throw Mary under the bus because I asked her for permission to say this in advance, <laughs> but you have one in the room right now. And that's fantastic. You have somebody who's testified on these types of issues and these types of, of, of medical history and expert circumstances and trials before. And I asked her if she'd be willing to do it in the future, and she said yes. And she also said, I mean, these are, these are services that she provides within the context of her job, right? So she, you're not getting charged an exorbitant expert witness fee either. I mean, that's amazing. 
And it's not, like I said, Earl mentioned earlier, it, she doesn't have to have been involved with the, with the victim. She doesn't have to have treated that person in the ER um, in order to be your expert witness. And the same is going to be true for um, you know, a lot of your EMTs, folks that are interested in this type of thing and really want to develop an expertise in this, you very well could be developed as an expert witness in this, in this field. True is also for law enforcement. Having an officer who does a lot of um, sort of an extra level of these DV investigations or these follow-up investigations, has more of these contacts, has more of this specialized training, puts, puts those folks in a place where you have this expert that can come and testify. When I started in Lane County, we were very lucky to have a designated investigator within our DA's office that did domestic violence follow-up. I know that's an extreme luxury. Um, and so, but this is an individual that we sent to every, every single training about everything. And so I'd have some weird nuanced thing come up in grand jury or in trial, and I can knock on his door and say, hey, I need you to come testify about X. And I know exactly what he's going to testify to because I know what his training and experience is, and I know that he can come in and establish his history and his expertise um, and explain this is why this type of circumstance happens, or this is why I wouldn't expect to see visible injuries within a strangulation case. Here are the signs and symptoms that are much more prevalent and that occurred in my review of the police report occurred in this case or what you just heard from officers X, Y, and Z, right? To be able to establish that. And that's a huge part of educating the public, educate, I mean, when it comes to each specific trial, the jury, right? But educating the public as a whole, educating your judges, educating the other parts of um, the criminal justice system that may need to see this information. We very much live in a world where jurors, I think CSI has like the actual show has maybe died a little bit, but I think we still sort of live in this world where, where jurors have these expectations of, well, CSI can pull fingerprints off of water, and they can see a license plate from 15 miles away. Well, that's cool. We don't have those capabilities. So there's limited information that we can give jurors, but there are things that we, that we can, right? And these are the types of things, if we can set somebody up there and say, you know, Mary, please tell me about your training experience when it comes to strangulation cases. I'm just going to sit back and let her talk for six, seven minutes, right? As she just rattles off her, like, basic training. And then let's talk about these more specific things, and she continues to go. And so then the jury's looking at somebody, well, this person knows their stuff. So when she says this is what it is, I'm more likely to believe that. And then it makes sense, right? When you have a medical professional or a professional in any realm giving the context to what it is that they actually see in front of them, then these cases can be prosecuted, and it's not just a victim up there that says, I'm telling you, he strangled me. I don't know why there's not any marks on my neck. I don't know why I can't breathe, right? <clears throat> So, um, I sort of skipped ahead on that. Um, so, any, and I skipped ahead on this too. So anybody can be a strangulation expert, really. It can be anyone, um, as long as they have that training and that experience and have an updated CV um, and are able to articulate that information. Um, and the other note I'll make is when they're, they're testifying as part of their job and essentially doing it pro bono, it's really nice when the defense says, well, how much are you getting paid to be here today? Mary <laughs> quipped earlier, $7.50 for parking. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty great. That's another thing that when the jury's looking at that is like, well, this person doesn't have a dog in the fight, right? They're not interested in, in one side or the other. This is just the information. This is just how it is, right? You have, again, in like Dewey cases, you have officers talk about their training and experience, what they go through, what the field sobriety tests are, how those are administered, why certain things are done, because that expertise is explained. And the same thing needs to happen um, in DV cases. So thank you very much for every single person in this room, one, for being here, and two, for doing the work that you do. This is not an easy job. This is not an easy realm. Um, I'll be the first to tell you that. And so I'm very thankful for what you do. Um, I have extra of the handouts if anybody needs, wants to take something to take it back um, to anybody, you're welcome to do that. I'm also happy to share any of this information digitally if somebody wants it. I think in the back somewhere I have my business cards um, and you are welcome to contact me. I'm happy to chat with anybody about issues or questions or thoughts or ideas, things that you'd like to see um, folks around the state be trained on more specifically. That's one of the things I get to do. Um, that I love about this position, and so um, my job is to help you, so um, thank you.